Good evening, everybody. We are Electric Grill Land. We've been giving your ears a little beautiful sound. Wow, that's nice. Everybody got quiet. We're like in the lunchroom, like little kids in the lunchroom. It's okay. <laughs> uh, we're Electric Grill Land. Welcome, everybody. We're here to, for your musical enjoyment. Uh, we're just playing a few fiddles and songs and slapping some hands and stomping some feet here. We're playing instrument wide uh, variety of instruments, basically based out of uh, West Africa, parts of Northern Africa. Um, most of them tell stories. Most of them don't. But we're just here to give a good smile on your face, and I hope the sun could come out after this dreary day. And I uh, hope everybody enjoyed themselves. So um, one thing that I, I, my friends and I, we, we work with school children at, at times when we do art and education work. Uh, we like to do the call and response, the antiphonal response thing. So when I go skank, skank, everybody say, wow, wow. Can we do that? You think we could do that? So when I say skank, skank, everybody say, wow, wow. OK, you ready? And you got to say it like with enthusiasm, like Villanova's winning the championship, and it's about to go down, and you know how you guys can do. I know what you guys can do. Student section, I know what you guys can do. So, so when I go skank, skank, you go, wow, wow. OK, OK, class, OK, we're there, we're there. OK, perfect. OK, you ready? Here we go. Skank, skank. A skank, skank. Now, if I go slow, you know what to do, right? So I go skank, skank. <laughs> skank, skank. Let's go to the right, like over these folks over here. Can I hear the right? All right, everybody on the right, ready? Skank, skank. Oh, man, nice. Let's go in the middle right here. All right, class, you ready? Here we go. Everybody say skank, skank. Good. Folks right here. You ready, class? All right, everybody skank, skank. Oh, good. Over here, here we go, to my right. That was my right over there, right? Yeah. Skank, skank. All right, now let's get everybody together with a big thunderous wow wow. All right, here we go, everybody say skank, skank. Stronger, this time stronger, so we can push that sun out. We want to push those clouds and get that sun out. I learned this from a good friend of mine. His name is Rotimi Haydn. He plays with um, Fela Kuti Sun Sunni um, in one of his bands, one of his Grammy-nominated bands. And one of the things that he made the band do when we were in rehearsal was to get the energy level, we would do that. And I, I thought that was kind of cool. And then I said, well, let me, you know, let me see what Fela did. And Fela did the same thing with the, with the crowd, which I love so much. And James Brown did the same thing. He would go, hey, hey, and everybody say, I'll be all right, huh? You know, James Brown. But here we go. Skank, skank. Wow, wow. One more time. Skank, skank. Wow, wow. All right, this time, my brother Ira right here in the back, he's a percussionist. He's going to repeat it. This time, I'm going to say skank, skank. No. He's going to say it on the djembe. And then you got to respond back. Call and response. We're going to make the drum a talking drum now. You think we can do that together? OK, cool. Here we go. One, two. Three, four. Wow, wow. Oh, we're late. We're all late. Yeah, we're at the university and we're all late and teachers are in the room. My bad. Here we go. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow. 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 Aha. A lot of these rhythms, call and response, deals with um, improvisation in jazz, improvisation in um, a lot of, lot of music, deals with improvisation, but call and response is, a very, root, is very rooted um, in jazz, blues, R&B, hip house, hip house, you know, all the genres of, of stuff that created in the urban centers. Um, improvisation was one of them, and call and response was one of them. It came out of that. Um, from the field howlers in North Carolina and down, down south to the call and response that a Yoruba ceremony might have. That's what they do. So that's uh, call and response and our little interactivity. My mom will be proud of everything that we just did because she told, you know, she said we got to give them the gusto. All right. Um, which one do? Yeah, let's play like a reggae type. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quit. Count one. Count Hey, hey, skank, 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 skank. Ah, oh, you thought you wasn't gonna be involved. Everybody clap. Everybody. Come on, let me hear you. Let's go. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Wow, wow. Skank, skank. Wow, wow. Skank, skank. Wow, wow. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Clapping. Now we gotta raise the roof. We're gonna go up. So everybody put them hands up like that, right? Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Skank, skank. Oh, wow, wow. 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 Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. Skank, skank. You guys are very rhythmically inclined. I love this. All right. Now, what are we going to do? On the count of three, I'm going like this. Check it out. One, two, three, and you're going to pee. So, skank, skank again. With your hands, everybody. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three, and. Huh. One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and. Ah, oh, come on. Now this time you gotta put your voice into it. Ready? You think you got it? One, two, three. All right, now so you say wow, wow. Ready? Here we go. Skank, skank. Wow, wow. 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 Here we go. All right, now we're gonna raise the roof again. One more time. I know, you like, the roof has been raised. How far are we gonna go? I mean, it's all the way up there. I mean, we're gonna try to retire our jerseys up there too. Here we go, ready? One, two, three, four, skank, skank. Wow, wow, skank, Every oh, come on, I see I see somebody in the back. I see a few people, let's get everybody, ready? Skank, skank, wow, wow, skank, skank. A wah wah, skank skank. A wah wah, skank skank. A wah wah. Ah, nice, you guys. You guys are the best. Aren't these guys good? They're good. These guys, give them a round of applause. Come on, yeah. Ah, here we go. Skank skank. Skank skank. Skank skank. A wah wah, skank skank. Wow, wow, you got it, you guys got it. You guys got that rhythm, y'all feeling it in your heart. I hope that sun comes out, cause tomorrow I gotta cut my grass. And I would like to. So I hope you guys enjoy pretty much the eclectic music that we brought here. So we're gonna end this, I guess. Can you hear me? Y'all guys can hear me say, everybody say yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ah. Oh. We brought an eclectic group of musicians and instruments here. My name is Rich Robinson. This is the Electric Rio Land. We are Electric Rio Land. We're based out of Philadelphia. We're researchers, travelers, lovers, no fighters. We love everybody. Our, our main motto is one rhythm, one voice. So any rhythm that you have, we may steal it and use it because we think that we have all the same voice. We're based out of Philadelphia. A lot of the things that we do here are things that we learned here but traveled about. So I hope to see you guys soon. I guess they're about to start in a few minutes. So sit back and relax. You can use Skank Skank and Wow Wow with your little kids at home. I hope you do.
and at the next family gathering, you can do that. All right, appreciate y'all. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Good evening. Do you think you could hear me? <laughs> Welcome to our celebration this evening. Not only of uh, of the not only is this the first day of our St. Thomas of Villanova celebration, but it's also a most special day. It is the 10th anniversary of One Book Villanova, and you are all a part of the party. And how about the band that got this party started, Electric Rioland? Aren't they wonderful? And I can think of no better person to really get this party started than our own party master, Father Peter Donahue. Thank you and welcome to this evening's presentation. This is the first time that we've actually joined together the St. Thomas of Villanova lecture with the one book. And I think tonight is a very appropriate night to do that because as Dr. Nance mentioned, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the one book program. And over these 10 years, we've had some phenomenal authors who have come to the university and have shared their experiences with us and have shared, most importantly, their books with us and the stories that they wove in them. Tonight, we are pleased, very pleased, that Wes Moore is here. And as he speaks about his own book, he speaks about a lot of things that um, resonate with our St. Thomas of Villanova celebration, about how people come together, how lives can change by the influence of others, how lives can be drastically altered by certain circumstances. And as we join together in this community this weekend for the St. Thomas of Villanova celebration and on Saturday the day of service, we recognize that we have a responsibility to go out and help people do things in their lives. We bring them nothing but ourselves. We bring them who we are and what we are about and our desire to help them live a better life and to do what they need us to do. So tonight, as we join together in this 10th celebration of the One Book Program and the 9th celebration of St. Thomas of Villanova's Day, we come together as a community to recognize the power of people in our lives. And I want to take this moment to thank particularly all the people that have worked on the St. Thomas of Villanova Day, particularly um, to uh, Chrissy Quisenberry and Michael Fox, the student representative, who have put a lot of work into it with a whole array of people but also for uh, Dr. Nance, Terry Nance, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, oh God. <laughs> Tom Mogan, I can't think, Tom Mogan and Craig Whelan uh, for putting this program together and for their 10 years of work on, this, uh, on the, the One Book program. So welcome, thank you for being here, and let's have a conversation. Thank you, Father Peter. Over the past 10 years, we have been to Afghanistan, North Carolina, Rwanda, New York City, Tehran, West Point, Seattle, Washington, Nepal, Chicago, and now to Baltimore, New York, and back to the main line. Our journey through the books selected as a part of One Book Villanova program have done more than just taken us to different parts of the world. They have allowed us to explore our humanity our ability to empathize with the sufferings of others, and our willingness to engage in hard truths about ourselves. The goal of One Book Villanova has always been to draw our community even more tightly together as we journey through the, con the continuous adventure of a book. For friends new to One Book Villanova, allow me just one second to say that this is no ordinary first year reading program. All of Villanova reads this book and has access to the programming that will follow. Even more important is the last part of our name, read it, share it. And I don't even know if members of the Villanova community know this, but over the last 10 years, 
we have collected books at the end of the year from students and then redistributed them to Philadelphia high schools, to neighborhood centers, and to senior centers around the Delaware Valley. I think that's pretty awesome. None of this, none of this would be possible without the loving attention of so many people. First and foremost, and I do mean first and foremost, let me begin by acknowledging John and Patty Imbasey. Through their generosity, we were able to marshal the financial resources to put a copy of the book into the hands of every single full-time matriculated undergraduate student at Villanova University. Not just one year, not just two years, but for all 10 years. We thank them for their vision and commitment. And how could I not take this moment to acknowledge dining services? Are they just incredible? Their creativity, yes. Their creativity, craftsmanship, and care in creating the phenomenal themed dinners year after year has just been extraordinary. And, there, and they, there are many one book programs around the country, but we have had author after author tell us that they have never had a program that included the dining experience that we offer here at Villanova. I think that's pretty incredible. The campus activities team also needs our recognition, and in, protect, in particular, Stephanie Giordano, this year's Cats and Ideas, is, Cats, this year's Cat Ideas and Issues Director, who operates together, who, and the Cat team operates as a well-oiled machine under the, in, the incredible guidance of a master mechanic, Nikki Hornsberry, to produce and run this event. And of course, I cannot name them all because they put me on the clock, but I would like to recognize the One Book Villanova Committee. And I ask some of them, to ri those of you who are here today, to rise because, uh, and as you're rising, I will say that this committee works all year round. It seems that once we pick the book, then we are, um, we are bent on getting it distributed, and then we are bent on getting the program started, only to begin again. And we will have a meeting, probably by the end of this week, in order to start on next year's book. And I would like to recognize one very special member of the Villanova uh, University, uh, One Book Villanova team, and that's Joan Prendergast. She has been with us for so many years, and we just can't wait for her to join us again. So. Come on and come back to work, Joan. Finally, I need to thank the two most incredible partners I could ever have in this venture. No one does this program alone. I had the great privilege of having a conversation one day with Joe Lucia, who was then the director of Falvey Library, about how cool it would be to have a reading program that was different at Villanova. And then I was joined by my good friend Tom Mogan, and together we put this together. There was no study, there was no formal committee. It was just the earnest desire of three, starting with three people that spread to a whole community that made this program possible. In many ways, we are evidence of the community that lives at Villanova. After the lecture this evening, we invite you all to adjourn with us to the back of the pavilion to celebrate our 10-year anniversary with cake and refreshments. Now, at this time, I would like to call to the stage a young man who knows our speaker quite well. They met in New York and grew close because, in our author's words, he was one of the few other black kids to attend the author's new school. We learn in the epilogue of the book that after overcoming a number of life's tragedies, our next presenter serves as a dean 
at Morristown Friends School outside of Philadelphia. More important, he has devoted his professional life to addressing the educational disparities in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage the person who will introduce our keynote speaker, Justin Brandon. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I don't know how to follow that. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank the One Book Committee for picking The Other Westmore as its read for the 10th anniversary of the One Book Villanova program, and for providing me with the opportunity to be here on stage tonight. As you just heard, my name is Justin Brandon, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Wes Moore. And for those who, who have read the book, I'm also known as the Justin from the book. <laughs> That's been my new name. As you've read, I've known Wes since third grade, when we first met in the Bronx. Wes and I became friends instantly. Maybe it was our interest in G.I. Joe, sports, or the fact that we were the only African-American boys in the third grade at Riverdale Country School. As you know from the book, our lives have taken lots of challenging turns that have made us stronger people. We have always been there for each other throughout the years, whether it was our own weddings, funerals, family reunions, a football game at Johns Hopkins, or birthday parties for our children, we stay connected. It's not every day that your best friend writes a New York Times bestseller that includes much of your life story. Thanks, Wes. I am so proud of what this book has done for so many people. It has created authentic conversations between parents and their children, students and teachers, community members and their constituents, and political leaders and policy makers. This book, these stories, are not simply about a good kid and a bad kid. They are about opportunity access to education, family, support, expectations, what is and has been accepted in our society over, over the years, and our responsibility to take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to us and to pay it forward. I hope that this book and this event and the events to follow will truly allow you to follow the words of the One Book Villanova program. Read it, share it. I will close with a quote from Helen Keller. Life is a succession of lessons which must be lived to be understood. I want to thank Wes for challenging me to be better every step of the way. And I hope that you will do the same. Now, please join me in welcoming my brother, best friend, Rhodes Scholar, war veteran, community activist, the long list, <laughs> husband, father, and New York Times bestselling author, Wes Moore. Love you. Love you. Yeah, I would say, so I had no idea he was going to do that. So, so in fact, in fact, let me say, can you say one thing? So let me share, let me say, so, hi everybody, hi Wildcats, how y'all doing? <laughs> so let me just share with y'all a text real quick. Let me, I'm asking permission if I can share it, so I don't get in trouble. Permission to share the text? Yes, yes, yes. All right. So text at 208, yo, you ready for Nova? I respond back, I guess, man, you coming up? He responds back, working on it. Working on it. <laughs> so, let me clarify. Working on it meant that at that point I was actually working on this introduction. <laughs> so I, was like, <laughs> I love you, boy. I love you. I love you. That's my heart, man. 
That's my heart. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, Justin is not only just one of the most important people in my life, he's one of the greatest examples of manhood in my life. He, um, you know, I, I feel like in many ways Justin is, has shaped what the definition of friendship is supposed to mean because it used to be, can you all hear me? Sorry. Friendship, I'd always thought kind of was the idea of who you, who you spent your time with, who you hung around with, and all that kind of stuff. A friend is someone who wants nothing but the best for you in all circumstances. Who wants nothing but the best for you in all circumstances. And that's a friend. And I am proud to say that Justin epitomizes that for me. So thank you. It means more than you know to have you here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> to the, uh, and, and, and listen, to, to the entire Villanova family for having, for having me here, you know, uh, you know, Father Peters and, 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 and Patty. I mean, this just, it, it means more than you know to have you here. To the entire student body, uh, to Dr. Vance, thank you so much for, for everything. To the entire team, to Dining Services for that ridiculous meal. Like, wh how do you find goat? <laughs> like, they found curry goat in Aki and Saltfish. I'm like, you can't find curry goat for a family. How do you find it to feed a whole community? <laughs> but I mean, and honestly, to all the students you know, for here, I mean, thank you for this incredibly warm welcome. You know, I'm always nervous when I go places where my book is mandatory reading. Because <laughs> you're never sure how mandatory reading is going to be received. Um, but to be part of this list, especially when you see the list of other books that have been selected for, for, for one book and one Villanova, it means more to me than you know. Um, you know, I know there's, there's, a, there's a few other folks who I just want to uh, briefly acknowledge. Too. I know there's a lot of folks from my Valley Forge family here. Um, you know, this is a place, you know, right down here in the main line. Now, let me tell you something. This is a place that I did not go running to Valley Forge because I wanted to go there. <laughs> but it's a place that I became a better and a stronger and a, 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 a better person and a better man because I went there. You know, I wear my Valley Forge ring. And, uh, and people sometimes ask me, they're like, you know, you, you did go to college, you went to grad school, and you choose to wear a high school ring. Why do you wear a high school ring? And my answer is simple, it's because without this place, nothing else would have been possible. So I'm just very thankful, and I know that there's a couple, you know, Sean Fox and, uh, and Lieutenant Colonel Mike Murnane are somewhere out there. Sean Fox is, uh, is not only one of the first people who I met at Valley Forge when I got there, from the first time we met, we have been inseparable. He's a person that, along with, with Justin, who was not just there with me at every moment in my life, but who stood with me when I got married, He's a person who, to this day, we, we're, we're either going to talk about what's going on with our families or we're going to talk about how bad the Giants are going to lose. <laughs> but that's my guy. And I love him with everything in me. And Lieutenant Colonel Mike Murnane, you know, I, I stand here today and I'm able to speak. First of all, let me just say, I am scared to death of speaking. All right? It's just true. Um, but but I, I, I feel like, and, and Colonel Murnane was the one who first really helped me to understand it. He was, and I talk, I talk about him in the book, where you know, he, he made things like the Federalist Papers come to life. And anyone who can make the Federalist Papers come to life is special. <laughs> but it also helped me to understand the importance of communication. And, and, and part of my college was paid for because of a scholarship that I got through the American Legion. And it was Colonel Murnane who first encouraged me to even apply for it. This is what we're talking about. The people who step up when they don't have to, but they do it because they have to. They do it because their lifeblood is the service of others. They do it because that's all we're ever really called to do on this planet, is to take care of one another. I'm incredibly proud to be here, because you know, Villanova, especially on the kickoff of of you know, what has turned out to be St. Thomas Villanova, because Villanova is something that I think it's important for everybody to understand. Is that as we're having these conversations about higher education and what it's all supposed to mean, let's not forget about what higher education is supposed to mean. You know, I know that right now, especially for all the freshmen here, y'all are about to get bombarded. And you're gonna get asked the question, literally, 
15 times a day. People are going to come up to you and they're going to say, so, what's your major? What are you going to study? And then the next question that comes after that is, and what are you going to do with that? You're going to get asked that question literally dozens of times every single day. I got asked that question at nauseam. I got asked that question so much seriously, I just started making stuff up so people would stop asking me. <laughs> like, what are you majoring in? I'm like, I don't know, you know, biomedical engineering of the fifth kind or something. I don't know. <laughs> just stop asking. But you get asked this question like it is literally the most important question that you will ever be asked. Like it's the only question that matters. And I get it, right? You're in college. It's higher ed. That's what it's supposed to be about. What do you get in your major? I'm going to be very, very honest with you right now. I finished my undergrad experience now almost 13 years ago. And no one anymore ever asks me, so Wes, what was your major in college? Doesn't come up. No one ever comes up to me and says, so Wes, how did you do on that test that you took on April 15th of 2003? No one ever anymore asks me, so Wes, remember that paper that you turned in at the end of your first semester of your sophomore year? How did that paper go? Because all that stuff fades. All that stuff loses its relevance. Now, I'm not saying don't do well in school. Don't, like, don't show up tomorrow and say, well, Wes Moore said school's not important. <laughs> it's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is never forget why you're here. Because if the only thing that you get from this place is you can walk across a graduation stage, then you've missed the point. If the only thing you get from your undergrad experience is a transcript, then you have missed the point. If the only thing you get to do is change the first line in your LinkedIn profile, then you've completely missed the point of what higher education is supposed to be all about. The most important thing you're gonna, not gonna, the most important thing you're gonna take away from this college experience is not gonna be your GPA. The most important thing that you're gonna take away from this collegiate experience is going to be your personal GPS. It's about having a sense of not just why you're here, but having a sense of the most important question that people are gonna ask you. And that is not what's your major. The most important question that people will ask you is who will you fight for? Who will you stand for when it's not convenient? Who will you advocate for when it's not easy? Who will you stand shoulder to shoulder with when it's not popular? And you might be the only person standing there, but you're doing it because it's right. That's higher ed. I can tell you the truth. I know a whole lot of people who have a whole lot of letters after their last name, who I can make an argument that they are not higher educated because they have yet to figure out a way of taking their academic training and turning it into doing something positive for somebody else. Your job, your mission, while you're here, is to help to define who will it matter that you are ever a wildcat to more than simply yourself. Who will this degree matter to? Who will your training matter to? Who will you step up for? And I would argue that in many cases, the definition of that and the people who have to benefit from that are the others. The ones who might not necessarily be students at Villanova. The ones who might not necessarily be on their path to higher education the ones who might come from different backgrounds, the, but the ones whose destiny matters as much to our long-term safety and security and greatness of a community as ours does. You know, I'm, I know probably like three quarters of y'all already published. This, is, this was my first book. <laughs> and um, when I first went through the process of writing this book, I didn't realize the way the publishing business worked, okay? Everything you see on the inside of a book, all the words, the structure, the content, all that kind of stuff, that's what the author wants to share with the world. That's the author's intent, right? All the words inside of a book. 
everything you see on the outside of a book, the cover, the title, the airbrushed author photos on the back, the blurbs, all that kind of stuff, that, that is what the publisher wants to share. Perfect example, this kid riding the bike, I have no idea who that kid is. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> People often ask, they're like, is that you or is that Wes? I was like, I don't know who that kid is. <laughs> and I remember that conversation with the publisher because I was like, because they said, what do you think? And I was like, who's this kid? <laughs> and they're like, they're like, but we love it because, you know, he's looking, he's riding the bike and he's looking back. I was like, okay. <laughs> But they hold on to the rights because they know that they have got, and they've done the math on this, they've done, they have 3.2 seconds to get your attention. If they do not get your attention in 3.2 seconds, you as the consumer will simply just keep on walking and you will move on to the next book. So they will do whatever it takes in 3.2 seconds to get your attention. I did not know that. I thought publishers cared about what authors thought. <laughs> so they call me in and they're like, Wes, what do you think that the title of your book should be? And I'm like, you know what? I'm glad y'all asked me. <laughs> because there's like six titles that I really like. And they're like, well, what are they? And I said, well, what about Baltimore Suns? Or what about Out of Many? Or what about All the Difference? Or what about End of the Innocence? Or what about, and I start rattling these different titles off, and I look at them, and I say, so y'all can go ahead and choose between any of those six because I'm good with any of them. <laughs> and they look at me, they say, that's very kind of you. Um, but we think we have a better idea. And they said, what do you think about the other Wes Moore? And I said, that might be the dumbest book title that I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. And they said, what don't you like about it? I was like, there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't like about it, actually. But let me go ahead and start with three. All right? The first thing I told them I like about it was I tried to make it very clear that this story is about much more than just these two kids. It's about much more than just one name. It's about much more than just one neighborhood. It's about much more than just one socioeconomic group. It's about much more than just one demographic. It's about much more than just one race. It's about much more than just one generation. It's about all of us. It's about the decisions that we make in our lives and tantamount to that, the people who we have in our lives who help us to make those decisions. So by putting the name inside of the title of the book, are you not completely negating that entire fact? That's one. The second thing I told my like about that title, what self-respected author do you know that puts their own name inside of a title of a book that they've written? You know, the other James Patterson, the other J.K. Rowling, the other, I mean, it sounds crazy, right? And the third thing I told my like about it, no one knows who one Westmore is. So why does anybody care who the other Westmore is? <laughs> so they looked at me and they smiled, and they're like, those are actually all really good points. They said, the problem, though, is that you're missing the point. Because you're absolutely right. It's not about you. And it's not about him. The name is completely irrelevant. You can throw any name inside of that book title. It really does not matter because the truth is there are Westmores that exist in every one of our communities and in every one of our schools and in every one of our homes. Kids who are literally one decision away from going in one direction or a completely different direction. People who every day are straddling the line of greatness and the problem is they don't even know it. The name does not matter. The most important thing about the title is the other. The ones who might not look like us, the ones who might not speak like us, the ones who might live in another part, another part of town than us, the ones who might come from a different family lineage, the ones who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, the ones who might not be sitting here tonight but whose destiny matters as much to the long-term safety and security and greatness of our communities as ours does. So much of this definition of higher education will never simply be about how you did on a certain test. 
but did you understand what your biggest test was? So much of this journey in higher education will not simply be about your coursework. It'll be about your course. And who did you use your voice for when it mattered most? You are in an unbelievable situation right now where people are going to take you seriously simply because you said it. That's the beauty of being a Villanova Wildcat. Because you attend one of the best schools in the country, people are going to take you seriously simply because it came out of your mouth. So then the bigger question becomes, what will come out of your mouth? There is not a single issue that this area, greater Philadelphia area, the state of Pennsylvania, that this country, anywhere in the world, there's not a single issue that we're dealing with right now that I am not convinced that there's enough intellectual capital and energy in this room alone that couldn't solve it. So the biggest question then becomes, will we? And it's not something that I fully understood until later. I intentionally didn't say something about one person who's in this room right now because I wanted to wait till right now to do it. You cannot understand my story without understanding the story and the power and the no pun intended, the joy that I have with the person who's sitting in this front row, my mom. My mother sacrificed everything for us. I mean, she, I think my younger sister said it best when she said, our mother wore sweaters so we could wear coats. Everything she ever had, she gave for her children. But I also want to be very clear, and I know she would want me to say this, that if your takeaway from this story is it was about a good mom and a bad mom, if your takeaway from the story was that it was about a good West and a bad West. If your takeaway from the story was that one kid got sent away and one kid didn't. Then not only would I argue that you'd missed the point, I would also probably argue that you didn't read the book. What we wanted people to understand with these stories are that that line between our lives is so unbelievably thin. I always say one of the greatest compliments I get from people, I was, I was with a, uh, a group of students this morning, uh, a school called Mastery, uh, which is in Philadelphia. And uh, one of the kids was telling me, they're like, you know, I found your book a little bit confusing because I was trying to figure out, so which West is he talking about now? And I smiled and I gave her a hug. And I said, thank you. And she looked so confused. She was like, okay, what is going on right now? Why is he giving me a hug? <laughs> and I told her, I said, that was the point. I don't want us to be so quick to congratulate or so quick to castigate without being able to peel the onions back a little bit to understand why. When people tell me that it's a bit confusing understanding which kid you're talking about, I always smile because I say that was the point. Because I always say, you know, listen, the, the other Westmore is the easiest open book test you'll ever take. Right? Two kids, one name, got it. But what we wanted people to get about those two kids in that one name is not necessarily just where they ended up, but start the book at its most fundamental and innocent point. Start the book with a three and a half year old boy who watches his father die in front of him. Start the book with a five year old boy who meets his father for the first time. Start there and then take the reader on this journey. A journey that eventually leads to, at the same time that the Baltimore Sun, which by the way is my hometown paper, I thought calling the book Baltimore Suns would be a cute play on that. My publisher thought different. 
But start with the ball, start there, and then take this read on this journey that leads up to the Baltimore Sun writing this article about this local kid who gets an award. And as they're talking a little bit about what the Rhodes Scholarship is and how I'm going to be one of these 32 American students going overseas, that they talk a little bit about my background and my childhood. And at the same time, they're writing a whole series of articles about these four guys who one day walk into a jewelry store. And now these first two guys walked in the jewelry store and they reached in their coats and they pulled out guns. And they cocked the guns back and they started pointing the guns at everybody inside the store and telling everybody to get on the ground and keep your hands on top of your heads. And everybody who was inside the store got on the ground and put their hands on their heads like they were told to. And then 10 seconds later, two other guys walked in the jewelry store and when they walked in the store, they reached in their coats and they pulled out mallets. And one guy with a gun, one guy with a mallet went to the left. One guy with a gun, one guy with a mallet went to the right. The ones with the guns were keeping everybody on the ground, while the ones with the mallets were just walking around and smashing out jewelry cases and taking out watches and rings and necklaces. The four guys met in the back of the store with a little over $400,000 worth of jewelry. And one of them yelled, let's go. And then all four guys then ran out of the center of the store and then ran outside to the adjacent parking lot. One of the people that was inside the store that day was an off-duty police officer who was moonlighting as a security guard. He was a 13-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Force. He was a three-time recipient of Police Officer of the Year. He was also a father of five who just had triplets. And the reason he was working that day was because it was a day off in the police force and he took on a second job as a security guard to make extra money for his family. And he got up off the ground and he drew his weapon and he ran outside to see if he could stop the guys from getting away. And when he ran outside, he started kneeling next to cars and vehicles to give himself cover. But he didn't realize that one of the cars that he was kneeling next to was one of the cars that the guys were in. And they rolled the window down and they shot him three times at point-blank range, and they killed him instantly. This police officer did nothing wrong besides go to work that day. And he never made it home. And there was a 12-day national manhunt for those four guys, and finally after 12 days, all four guys were caught. And one of the people that the police were looking for that was eventually captured and tried and convicted and sentenced for the crime was this guy whose name was also Wes Moore. And I knew there were questions I wanted to ask, and Wes was the only one that could answer them. So one day, I just decided to write him a note. And literally, that first note was like, hey, Wes, my name is Wes. Here's how I heard about you. And I had a whole list of questions that I asked him. And a month later, I get a letter back from Jessup Correctional Institution from Wes Moore. And, in the, and that one letter eventually turned into dozens of letters. Those dozens of letters turned into dozens of visits. And now I have known Wes for close to a decade. And sometimes people will say, so, you know, what's the one thing? What's the one thing that happened that made one kid go one way, one kid go another? I mean, I remember I had someone come up to me about nine months ago. And they said, I just want to let you know I didn't like your book. And I'm like, that's cool. Um, but I said, if you don't mind me asking, what didn't you like about it? And they said, well, because you wrote about these two kids, and you talked about what happened with these two kids, and then when it came time for the end of the book to explain, so what was the one thing that happened, you don't give an answer. And I told him, I said, listen, you know, I said, with all due respect, I'm sorry that you didn't like my answer. I'm not sure if I love your question. Because the truth is, there is no one thing. There's no single thing that we can do for a child to make them go one way or another way. There's no pill that we can make them take and tell them everything will be just fine. It isn't the matrix, like red or blue, red or green pill. Raising kids is amazingly complicated. And when you happen to raise kids in some of the most dangerous communities of our country, it is that much more complicated. I will debate with anyone who wants to stand up and tell me that every child is born with the same amount of assets. Because if there's anybody who really believes that, there are some communities in this state alone that I would love to take you to and hear you make that same argument. I'm a firm believer that potential in this country is universal. Opportunity is not. 
And the difference, the space between potential and where we all end up, that's where we all come in. The higher educated. The ones who understand that life for yourself is nothing. That life for others is everything. That if the only thing that you get from your higher ed experience is a transcript, is a piece of paper that you can frame and throw up on a wall, then I question why you even went in the first place. That higher education has got to be more than simply a degree. But it's about finding that thing that you will give up everything for, that you will throw your life down for, and you're doing it because you know that without it, there's no life at all anyway. There's never going to be a one thing that can help. There's never going to be a one thing that we can do. There's never an idea that, well, if everyone does X, then we'll be just fine. Part of the beauty of higher education is not telling people what to think, but it is asking them to think. Think about what is it in your life, whether it be veterans issues, whether it be the environment, whether it be young people, whether it be seniors, whether it be whatever it is, what is that thing in your life that you know you would give everything for? And mobilizing around it and attacking it with everything you've got. The point of this story was not to cast revisionist history. The point of this story was not to reinvent the past. It was not to create sympathizers. It was not to start a free West campaign. West's fate is sealed. West received life in prison without the possibility of parole. He's in year 13 of a life sentence. Him, his older brother, and two other people who were there that day. The point of this was not to question that fate. The point of this was to question why his fate was sealed so long before February 7th of 2000, and what can we do to keep avoidable tragedies from continuing to happen. We understand our own lives by understanding the impact that we can make on others. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll close this now and I'll take questions, but you know, I, I look at higher education like it's a brand new car. You know, just like higher education, and work with me on this one, right? But just like higher education, you go out to the dealership and you go step foot on the dealership and you're looking at these, all these different cars, like that's the one I want. Just like you say, that's the college I want to go to. And you bring your friends when you go get this brand new sports car and it's a beautiful car. And you go on, your friends take a look and they're like, wow, this thing is pretty. And you're like, yeah, it's pretty. Wow, this thing is fast. Yeah, it's fast. Wow, this thing's expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. And we got a whole lot of people who then get behind the wheel of their brand new sports car and they turn that ignition and they pull out of that dealership and they're driving down the highway and this car goes 200 miles an hour and they're driving at 20 so everybody can see them. <laughs> Rolling the window down. Your car goes 200 miles an hour. Why are you driving at 20? Take it for a spin. Let's see how fast this thing can go. Let's see how many corners this thing can curve. How, let's see just how amazing this vehicle is. Why are you driving at 20? You want to drive this car so hard that when it comes time to turn the car in, you can just drop the keys off because you drove that car until the wheels fell off. Why is higher education any different? You're in one of the best schools in the world. Take this thing out for a spin. Let's see how fast and how far this thing can take you. You have worked extremely hard to get here. Work harder. You have sacrificed a lot in order to get here. Sacrifice more. You have done so much and given so much to get here. Get ready to give even more. That's what higher education is all about. That's our point. That's why we're here. Do well in school. 
Get good grades. All of you should make the honor roll. But never forget why you're here. Never forget that if Villanova felt that the peak of your career, the peak of your life, would be that you would be a graduate of Villanova, then you never would have been accepted in the first place. If they honestly felt that the peak of what you would ever accomplish was the fact that you were a wildcat, then you, ne then you would have not received a, a large packet. You would have received a small envelope. The reason you are accepted is because they expect more. And that more is not simply how you're going to do in your classes, even though that's part of it. The more is how many people it will matter to that you were ever a wildcat in the first place. Thank you for not just selecting the book and for this invitation. Thank you for the conversation and the action behind it. The point of this was not to tell a story. The point of this was to be part of a movement. That's why we do what we do. God bless you guys, and thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Y'all are so sweet. I appreciate that. Thank you. We have a microphone up here for anybody who would like to ask any questions. You can come over here. We have a microphone here for questions. We collected some questions from the audience, so I will start with the first question. In one of the other Westmore sections, he curses God, and he says he must not be present in West Baltimore. What role do you think religious faith plays in a person's life? Mm. You had to anticipate this question at Villanova. No, that's... <laughs> it's a beautiful question, and it's, a, it's an incredibly important question. So, um, so, so I'll, I'll backfill it in, in a couple different ways. You know, I, um, I look at Wes now, and so Wes, since Wes went to prison, he has become, he's become a Muslim since he went to prison. And, uh, and part of the reason, as he said, that he was first even introduced to Islam was, uh, was because of his brother. It was because his, he and his brother were in separate parts of the prison, but, he but his brother told him that the only way we can see each other is if you tell him you're a Muslim, and then they'll let you go to Friday services, and then if you go to Friday services, we can actually see each other. So Wes did it really as a way initially of being able to see his brother. And Wes said while he was there, he actually started listening to what the imam was telling him. And he said it was really there that he actually started to have a better understanding of who this God he would worship was and what he expected of his life. So I see the role that, that, that religion and the role that, in, in the case of Wes, Islam, has played in his life. And I know that, you know, Wes is also a different, like when I first met Wes and when I think about Wes when I first met him and Wes now, that there is definitely an evolution and a difference in the person that he is. And I think part of that comes with age. Part of that becomes with him accepting his, his, his sentence. And I do think part of that actually has to do with, with this introduction of Islam into his life and the fact that he does take his religion seriously. But I also know the impact, in, in my case, of Christianity and what that meant to my life is just as real. Where, to be honest, I mean, my, my grandfather was a... Uh, was a minister. He was the, uh, the first black minister in the history of the Dutch Reformed religion. And I remember going to church on Sundays and, uh, and almost sitting there, you're listening to him preach, and I'm sitting there looking at the clock, hoping he'll be done by kickoff. And it really wasn't until I became a teenager and late into my teenage years that I really understood that all the times that you think you're alone on this journey, you're never alone. That you're walking with a presence that is much greater than you. And I believe that one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, and again, this is just my, it's my opinion, but it's one of the greatest gifts that God gave us was his gift of free choice and his gift of free will. 
where all of your great glories are there in front of you. But he didn't create us to be robots. Your great gifts and your great glories are right there waiting for you. And then he simply asks each and every one of his children, will you grab it? Are you ready for it? And when it's standing right in front of you, are you willing to take it? I remember my, uh, my sister said something that I think is so beautiful, where she said her definition of hell would be one day God showing her everything she could have accomplished had she only tried. I think the role that religion plays in not just Wes's life and my life is real. We have different religion, religious bases. The names of the, of the gods that we pray to are different. But I also know that you can understand the evolutions that took place in both of our lives, both throughout the duration of the book and then also post-2000 when the book ends, without also understanding the fact that both of us feel and continue to feel more and more each day that we are not alone on this journey. And the more we could grasp that, the more we could understand that, the more we could embrace it, and the more we could love each and every embrace of it, the better off we were. I know where my strength comes from. I will never be mistaken of that. And I will never forget that. Thank you. Um, this question was asked twice. Uh, do you still keep in touch with the other Wes? Yes, thank you. And, and, and the answer is yes. I saw Wes four weeks ago. I'll probably see him again in another, in another few weeks when I get back. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm still in touch with him. And I, and I do know that there are some people who have a problem with that. Um, you know, I've had people who have come up to me and said, you know, don't, I don't know why you're still in touch with him. Don't you know he's a murderer? And, you know, I, I get it. And the truth is, is that um, I know why Wes is in prison and I don't need anybody to remind me. I know why he's there. I have never once made excuses for Wes's actions, nor will I ever make excuses for Wes's actions. But there are a couple things that I do know. One, I did not reach out to Wes to write a book, so I don't know why now that a book is written, why I would stop reaching out to him. And the second thing that I do know is that even our worst decisions do not separate us from the circle of humanity. And that, and that we have choices when tragedies happen. We can ignore them, or we can do something about them. My problem with ignoring them is this. When tragedies happen and you act like they didn't happen, then tragedies keep happening. And that, to me, is the worst possible takeaway from a tragedy, is to continue to allow them to happen because we didn't want to understand them. In my personal opinion, if we aren't willing to take time to understand Wes and lives like Wes, then we are doomed to keep on repeating this. We're doomed to keep on having ourselves and having more and more families experience pain that they should not have to feel because we're not, we're not willing to understand what the origins and the roots of many of these tragedies are. And I do know that, and again, this is not making excuses for him or his actions, I am a more thoughtful, I am a more grateful, and I'm a more thankful person because I got to know Wes Moore. Because in many ways for me, getting to know that Wes Moore truly forced me to get to know this one as well. And I feel like throughout the process of getting to know him that I've become a better person because of it. Question over here. Mr. Moore, thank you, first of all, for a thoughtful and uh, poignant presentation. I, was, I am moved by your words, so thank, thank you. you very much for that. Thank you. My question, having written this book, the evolution that you've talked about in terms of the Westmore, the other Westmore that's not sitting with us tonight, could you discuss what your evolution has been like since the publication of this book? How have you changed as a person? And as a follow-up to that question, 
Um, you've spoken very optimistically about the potential, not only this audience, but the potential of us as part of the human uh, community. Would you also maybe dare, dare to talk about some of the challenges, some of the darker sides of the human experience that you see possibly as presenting a potential for change, change that we may not necessarily see here now at this time in our lives, and how perhaps through the process of writing this book that, uh, that may have, uh, might instruct the way you can answer that question. Beautiful questions. Beautiful questions. What's your, what's your name? Nick Banton. Thanks, Nick. Beautiful questions. Um, so on the first one, how I've changed since the book has been published. You know, I, um, <laughs> this is going to sound odd. One thing, if you all haven't noticed, I'm not the most politically correct person in the world, um, if you haven't noticed already. But um, I used to be heavily cognizant and careful about what other people thought about what I should do. It's not that I don't care anymore, but I just don't care anymore. <laughs> um, but here's, here's what I mean by that. Here's what I mean by that. I, I think that I very much was trying to, even with, throughout the process of getting to write this book and as the book first came out, you know, very much trying to figure out, okay, so what is my place? What is my role? And then almost trying to look at external things to try to help understand what, is it, what are the things that I should be involved in and engaged in, helping lead and guide and direct. Until I started realizing that the answer was right directly in front of me. Until I started realizing that I don't need to tiptoe or walk on eggshells. That if we're not using our voice for something, then what's the point of having a voice in the first place? That if we're not willing to step up and step out and truly go out there and push, then what's the point of a platform? You know, I, um, there's a woman named, have you all ever heard of Lauryn Hill? She's an R&B artist, hip hop singer. Okay, very good. See, we have some old school cats here. I like so Lauryn Hill was a hip-hop artist, R&B artist, and she did this album called The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. This thing was crazy. I mean, like, I think she won like eight Grammys. They were literally making up awards just to give to her. This album was that good. It's, it's one of these albums that literally you push play and you just sit back because you don't have to do anything else. Just listen, right? And she has a song on that album. It's number 15, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's number 15 on the CD, right? But if you listen to it, she says something that I think is incredibly right and powerful, which she says, and everything, every time I try to be what someone else thought of me, so caught up I wasn't able to achieve. But deep in my heart, the answer, it wasn't me. So I made up my mind to define my own destiny. And I think in some ways, that's what this book, when I think about my evolution, has really allowed me to do was to make up my mind to define my own destiny. Was to understand that if we have a chance to actually do something special, then why wouldn't we? What are we waiting on? And so I think in, that the book has really helped me to embrace my inner impatience. And embrace my inner impatience with this constant reminder that none of us are promised anything. We're not promised more days or more weeks or more years. No one has ever tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey Wes, You've got about 6,542 days left so you can pace yourself. And nobody ever will. So I think what it's done is help me to understand that since we're not promised anything, then while you're here, do something with it. And the second question, I'm sorry, remind me of the second question again? Sorry, you took me to a whole new place. Optimistic, uh, yes, challenges. the less optimistic. Yes, thank you. Another great question. Um, I feel like I'm an optimistic person by nature. So even thinking about the less optimistic things, I think there's, there's a certain realism that sets in with me, but there's this constant battle between my realism who's punching and my optimism who's punching back. But when I think about the, you know, there's certain realities in, in our communities and there's certain realities in this world that we have to confront. 
There are certain realities, I mean, we think about even just current events, whether they be issues that are taking place in some of our cities right now, or whether they be things that are taking place in Syria, in northern Syria, in Iraq right now. There are certain realities that have to be addressed. And the truth is, there are certain elements that negotiation is not an option. There are certain people who will meet, whether they be members of international groups or whether they be people who are currently inside of our criminal justice system, who the idea of cooperation and negotiation is off the table. I get it. I understand it. I've seen it firsthand. But the other thing that I do understand is this is, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in this idea of the, uh, of, uh, you know, the serenity poem, right? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There are certain things that we cannot alter or change. I get it. And that need to be dealt with certain ways. I get it. But our world is full of things that can be changed. And the only thing that I ask is that God, God grant me and us the courage to be able to address those things. I understand the realism and the reality of, of the world that we live in. And not everything is peachy and not everything you can, you can just hit with a large dose of optimism and think that things will be fine. I get it. But I also do understand that the vast majority of things that we are talking about every single day, even things that somehow on the external side seem to be so unbelievably difficult and hard. I know they're not as hard as we think they are if we're just willing to put some work and some effort into it. You know, there's a, there's a beautiful poem by a guy named Paul Lawrence Dunbar. It's called We Wear the Mask. And it says, we wear the mask that grins and lies and it hides our teeth and it shades our eyes. This debt we pay for human guile with torn and bleeding hearts we smile. And it continues on. And I believe that so many times when you look at a lot of the situations that we have in our lives, we're surrounded by people who every day that we can call them impossible to break through and we can call, we can give every single name we want to give to them. But essentially what you have are people who wake up every day and put on the mask. And they put on the mask the same reason why we put on masks at Halloween. We put on masks at Halloween because you don't want to be seen. And if there's one thing that we know in our own lives is that if a person isn't close to you, they can't hurt you. If someone who, do, who you don't know makes a comment about you, or puts something on a blog about you, or says something on social media about you, do you really care? I mean, I don't. Maybe I have a thick skin, but I mean, like, I just don't care what someone is writing in their grandmother's basement about me. I don't. They don't know me. But if someone who's close to you does something, that hurts. And so in many cases, what do you do if that's your reality? What you do is you keep the whole world at arm's reach because if no one's close to you, then nobody can hurt you. We wear the mask. There are certain things that have to be addressed in certain ways that aren't pleasant, and I, and I understand that. But I also understand that if we're willing to put on the work, that becomes an unbelievably distinct minority versus the greater beauty beautiful world majority that we can actually live in and enjoy. Another question back here? Hi, Mr. Moore. Hi, Mr. Moore. I'm uh, Patrick Getsky. I'm a freshman in the business school. Hi. And uh, I was just wondering, with the importance of uh, first impressions and knowing um, kind of the backstory of the other Wes Moore, what was it like uh, meeting him for the first time, kind of having that first interaction with someone who, same name, but such a different path? Good question. You said Patrick? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, great question, Patrick. It was wild because, you know, up until that point of actually meeting him, Wes and I are almost like glorified pen pals. You know what I mean? Like, seriously, like, he writes a letter, I write a letter. He writes a letter, I write a letter. That was our relationship for a long time. And then finally one day when he was like, you know, if you'd like to come visit, let me know. And I can put you on my visitors list. And I'm like, yeah, I'd like that. So go in, you go through the process, put on a visitor's list. And it takes about six to eight months to get on the visitor's list of someone in the maximum security facility. So you wait for your clearance, because they have to do background checks and all that kind of stuff. You wait for your clearance. Your clearance comes in. You get on the list. 
finally you can go see him. And it was wild because it's like when you first walk into a prison, especially a maximum security facility, you never forget where you are. Everything is magnified. I mean, from the squeaks of the shoes to the, to the uniforms, to the, to the sound of, the, of gates slamming behind you before the first ones even are, are allowed to open up. You know, and as you start sitting down and, and you're first meeting this, 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 this doppelganger, right, this person who shares your name and, you know, you guys have talked and gotten to know each other through letters, but now here you are talking. At first it kind of feels uncomfortable. And you start to get into your, your own comfort. You're just talking. You're talking about family. You're talking about sports. You're talking about Baltimore. You're talking about a whole bunch of stuff. But the realities that are all around you never leave you. Especially that reality that when it's time to go, when a guard comes up and taps him on the shoulder and says, time's up, and then he goes his way through gates, and you go your way through gates. And honestly, it's something that I don't know if, if I, I still have never gotten used to it. Even when I still go see him to this day, it's not something that you get used to. And I don't think it's something you're supposed to get used to. But the idea of first impressions were, were, were amazing, both from the time that I met him, but even from the time that I first heard from him. And I try to be even clear about it in the story, was that Wes has made some horrific decisions in his life, but Wes is no dummy. And that compounds the tragedy of this entire story. The fact is, is that Wes could be doing some really interesting things in his life had different decisions been made. But we know that for the rest of his life, he will spend time in his six by eight cell. And that really does compound this bigger and larger tragedy that that whole day of February 7th epitomizes. Last question, Wes. Yes. Um, so what's next? What is next for, for Wes awesome. Moore? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, well, you know, and one, th one thing I'll, I'll say too, and, and first let me, let me couch it, and then I'll come back to actually what, what's next. Um, I used to be in a big rush to answer that question. I used to be like, I need to have an answer, I need to have an answer, I need to... And I used to be scared when I used to hear people tell me, like when I used to ask people that question, and they would then lay out the next 40 years of their life. And then when I'm 30, I plan on moving to this neighborhood, and da 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 and then maybe when I'm 35, I'll get promoted to senior vice president, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I am so far behind the curve on this because I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. And I used to get really scared. Um, I think something that I've learned and, and realized, though, is that part of the joy of life is that journey. And while it's important to have a sense of vision as to where you want to be and what you want to do, you don't want to enter into it so programmed that you're letting life look at you, wave, and then keep moving because you weren't afraid, you weren't prepared to accept its blessings. So I think, but I think about some of the things that we're working on now and a couple of things that I'm really excited about. One is, uh, you know, we're doing uh, more writing. And in fact, come, or come January 13, I think we have some things here, some, uh, some pamphlets here, people want to take a look at it, but uh, uh, there's a new book that we're releasing, that I'm releasing called The Work. And the work really examines some of these elements that we've talked about even tonight. This idea where the other West Moore, if the other West Moore is a story about the journey of how do we make it to adulthood, the work is really a journey, it's a story about what happens next. We've made it. Now how do we make our lives matter? And the thing that I really try to do in this story is, is understanding both my life and this in the, in the process of what's happened over the past decade. So we talk about our time in Afghanistan and time working in, finan working in finance as the collapse was happening, time working in, the, in, the, in, 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 in Washington. But then also highlighting nine different people who some by accident and some completely intentionally have found their work. They've found their point, and many of them have found it, and the only string that connects all of these people is service, is they've found their point 
because they first started with a journey of trying to do something for others. So for example, we highlight this woman named Kara Ali, who, uh, who was raised by a single mother in poverty. And when her mother was 14 years old, she found her first job. She found a job that changed the entire trajectory of the entire family, not realizing how important that job was going to be, but it was. And so Kara is now an entrepreneur, and she started a company called American Mojo. American Mojo is an apparel company. But Mojo stands for Mothers and Jobs. The reason she called her company American Mojo is because the only people she will hire in her company, from the very top of the organization to the bottom of the organization, are single mothers who live in poverty. And she does it as a tribute to her mother. Because she wants this opportunity. She wants that phone call that she's going to give to that mother telling him, congratulations, you're a new employee. She wants that to be the gift that that one job was to her mother and to their entire family. We highlight two of my friends named John and Dale. And they grew up in Statesville, North Carolina together. And they both joined the Army together right out of high school. And they're in Iraq together. And John was driving a Humvee, and Dale was sitting in the passenger seat. And one day, as their convoy was moving down the street, an IED went off and blew the vehicle sky high. The paramedics and the medics came in quickly and were able to save Dale's life, but they weren't able to save his legs. And so Dale was now recovering and healing back home. But what he realized that a lot of other people didn't realize, that John had no physical injuries, but John was dealing with a very severe case of PTSD and also survivor's guilt because he was the one driving the vehicle that almost killed his best friend. Dale saw that. Dale saw that John was becoming suicidal. And John would always tell Dale, listen, it's my fault. If there's anything that I can do, please let me know. Please let me know. And Dale's like, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And finally, one day, Dale called up John, and he said, you know what? I think I do need your help. And he said, I think I want to build homes for service-disabled veterans. And John looks at his phone, and he's just like, how are you going to build homes? You have no legs. And Dale says, but you do. And they first started by building a first little ramp in Statesville, North Carolina for a service disabled Vietnam veteran. And now they started an organization called Purple Heart Homes, where they literally go around the country building homes together for service disabled veterans. That's their work. That's their point. A principal in Baltimore City who started in the classroom and realized that he was not a very good teacher but he loved education, so he said, let me try the administrative side, and that's where he found his passion. And he literally turned one of the worst schools in Baltimore City, a school that was set to be closed, he turned it from being one of the worst elementary schools in Baltimore City to now being one of the top blue ribbon schools inside of the city in a matter of four years. And if you ask him the secret to his success, he says two things. We have high expectations here, and every single one of my children, when they walk in, he's there at 7 o'clock every morning, and every child that walks through his door, he hugs them and he tells them, I love you. And if you ask him why, he says, because he knows that for many of his kids, that's the first hug they've gotten all morning, and that's the first person that's told them, I love you. He's found his work. And so this story, this book that we're, just, we're, we're really excited about, um, out January 13th, available now for pre-order if anyone's interested in seeing it. <laughs> is just about how do we find our work? At some times when the world seems so chaotic around us, how do we pinpoint and find what it is that we're supposed to be doing? And I guess, part, and I guess the second part of the answer is my work is really dealing with higher education. It's understanding the fact that 9% of veterans who start college actually end up completing and getting a degree. It's understanding the fact that lower-income, first-generation students, that the number hovers around 14%. And in my opinion, it is embarrassing and it's unforgivable. And so as we started doing work and started understanding, we realized that, the, that in many ways we don't have a college completion crisis. What we actually have is a college freshman year crisis because for many of the students that we're talking about, 
Where we lose them is not necessarily in the college process, but where we lose them is in the first 12 months. For many students, it's in the first six months. So we're working on an initiative now, a platform that basically says, well, if we know that the freshman year is the choke point, why not reinvent the freshman year? And so we have our pilot groups of students who are actually in Baltimore City right now where we're working to not just do academic, we're working with the universities to not just do academic credentialing and for the classes and restructuring of the academic calendar, but at the same time introducing an entire co-curriculum platform of service learning and internships and all personalized for that student. So at the end of the year, so it's a softer on-ramp to higher education. So at the end of the year, the student doesn't just have academic credits, but a, a greater sense of social capital and a greater sense of self. That's my work. I'm excited about the things that we do because I feel like in many ways we have found our point. And that's the things, those are the things that I'm really excited about continuing to explore. And people say, what is it that you want to do when you get older or whatever? My answer is actually pretty simple. I want to be useful. Because if I've done that, then I feel like I've done everything I've been asked to do. Please join me in thanking Wes Moore. You're going to have to go. Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Bless you, Doc. Oh, can I say one more thing? Just real quick. Sorry, sorry. I know y'all got to go, but just one more quick thing. I, if there are people who did have, you know, have questions or, or anything along those lines, like honestly, anyone who is about the business of other people, I will be honored to be your wingman. So if anybody, you know, it's, you know seriously, so please, my email is easy. It's just Wes at theotherwestmore.com. Or if y'all are on Twitter, it's just Westmore1. Um, I do respond and I do, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I've learned. It's taken a while, but I've actually learned. But I am so incredibly proud of you. And from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of my soul, I thank you for not just the things you've done so far, but I'm excited for what you're about to do next. So God bless y'all. Thank you.